We had the Lenara Connect here in San Francisco, and who are you? Uh, I was hoping you could tell me. You are uh, Paul McKinney. Oh, McKinney okay. From IBM, and um, you're right. I am. Okay, I'm glad. Thank you for clearing that up for me. And we did a video at the at the Lenara Connect a few years ago. Uh, yeah, like five. Five years ago. Okay. That, that was the last time you were at Lenara Connect. Hong Kong. And uh, so, what have you done since then? Uh, mostly, you know, the usual stuff. Beat up on RCU. Uh, did a little bit of uh, chasing down quantum computing. Um, uh, going back and forth on trying to make. I mean, the biggest challenge for me, actually, the thing I realized a few years ago, uh, is that Linux runs on billions of machines. That's not a big, I mean, it's 1.4 billion Androids as of, what, three years ago? But I was talking to Dave Russling, and he was saying he thought the number was about 20 billion. 20 billion Linux in ARM machines. 20 billion Linux machines. Maybe most of them are ARM, I don't know. But he just yeah. said, but I, since it was Dave, I'm going to guess ARM was uh, played heavily in that estimate. So. How thing much is, of those 20 billion devices have your so all of them have your all software? All of them, uh, core RCU, it's in every one of them. Okay, so let's let's talk about this here a little bit. Let's suppose that RCU has a bug in it that happens on a given machine, on average, once every million years. Okay, that's happening like 30, 40 times a day across the installed base. Now, I've been doing validation of concurrent software for more than 25 years. I'd like to think I'm pretty good at it, but I'm here to tell you, <laughs> I mean, I've done a lot of stuff. I've, 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 I know a lot of different ways to cheat, you know, dirty tricks, but 20 billion is a really big number. Thing is, you know, you've heard of Murphy's Law, right? Of course you have. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever can happen will, right? And now, if, if you have an installed base of 6,000 machines, like I did when I worked for Sequent in the 1990s, Murphy's actually a pretty nice guy. Everything that can happen will. Eventually. Maybe in geologic time. But when you have 20 billion machines, Murphy's a real jerk. Everything that can happen will, and it happens really fast. That happens right now. Yeah, pretty All much. Yeah. What's happening? Uh, well, we don't really know, right? I mean, there's there are some projects to try to gather oopses and things like that, but if your light bulb panics, how would you know? Uh, the rumor I hear, the rumor, uh, th this may be, this may be FUD from a certain competitor of ARM, okay? I don't know, right? But the rumor I heard was they just don't validate the SOCs, some of the SOCs, because it takes too long and it costs money. And the software just resets the thing if something bad happens. Um, okay, so how would you know? How would you know? Now, now I, could, I could take that, I mean, you've got a smartphone, right? Is it Android probably? Yeah, of course. Yeah, okay. So do you expect that Android is to be working a million years from now? Of course, it has to work, right? All right, this guy's an optimist. <laughs> this guy's an optimist. I, lo I love that. Yeah. But um, the thing is, even even if you weren't that much of an optimist, uh, the fact is that there's certain places in the world, uh, a few in Europe, and, and maybe here in the United States, the same. I, I haven't checked out. Where if you have a device, okay, some device is supposed to get some purpose, some job done, and it's something with mechanics in it and maybe electrical, and it's probably got a computer in it. I mean, what device doesn't have a computer these days? In my car is a rolling, uh, the front of the car I got, I mean, it's got two touch screens and I'm having a hard time because it's like, okay, how do I tell this, what the air conditioner is doing? Oh, okay, it's just a round knob, you know, you're, it's, you're going, and you look up, oh, it's up on the, up on the screen, right? Uh, so, the thing is, though, that some of these devices, it, they have regulatory controls on them. So, they have testing you have to do. So if you run it for some number of years, and depending on what it is, it might be as few as three years, it might be as many as 20, but if it does what it's supposed to for some period of time, safety critical. So there are, I, I, I haven't, I have no public indication of this. However, I've talked to people who claim to have installed Linux kernel for applications that put the public at risk. So this bit about hiding behind soft hardware unreliability just isn't... I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd feel really bad if my software killed somebody, right? Can you make software that, that uh, has some kind of AI that validates itself constantly or something? You could. On the other hand, uh, one of my professors uh, back in the day taught me uh, um, functional programming, it was. He's now at DARPA. He's a second-line manager, and part of his remit is verification. You know, software verification, formal verification. And he got up in front of a bunch of people a year and a half ago and said, okay, uh, one of our priorities is doing formal verification of deep learning, machine learning software. And most of the academics of the crowd went <coughs> like that. Uh, 
but but the, again, what you've done is you said, okay, we're using this machine learning stuff, but that's just a magic, right? Because now, how do I know that the machine learning stuff is operating correctly? If there's some condi condition where it should reboot the machine and it fails to, that's a failure that might put the public at risk. So, you know, um, in any case, there actually are some things that might be helping here. Uh, there's uh, uh, what happened is that uh, some years ago, uh, I was in a memory ordering conference. It was a workshop. Um, and uh, there were a bunch of formal verification people there. And so I was getting up and talking to them, and they were giving me a hard time about formal verification. I said, yeah, you know, I've used formal verification since the early 1990s. Uh, there's something called Cromwell and Spin. It's, uh, it, you basically write a program in it. It's its own little language, kind of like Pascal and C, kind of, sort of. But instead of executing it step by step, it does a full state space search. And so it just goes, and anything that program could possibly do, it finds it. And you can put assertions in there, or you can make little time-based uh, logic expressions, essentially saying, if this happens, this has to happen sooner or later, or if this has happened, this thing can't happen, or any you know, things like that. And it'll go and it'll verify it, as long as your program is small enough. And that's been really helpful, but it's only good for design. If the thing is, the Linux kernel comes out every two or three months. So if I'm gonna use Promola, I have to hand convert from Linux kernel C to this Promola language, like five or six times a year. I'm a human being, I'm gonna make mistakes, right? Um, so, you know, I make a change. How do I change my problem model to match? Did I do it right? Did I really catch something? If, you know, I said, oh, this change shouldn't affect the problem. Well, well should it have? Um, was there a bug in there already that I failed to notice? Uh, so what you really need is you need something that will actually read the C code, or better yet, the binary produce, because then you, if you read the binary produce, you can ignore compiler bugs. Right, because you just look at what the compiler produced. Who, who cares whether the compiler had a bug or not? If, you, if the, what it produced is correct, then no big deal, right? Anyway, uh, the what you're describing here is, a, is a, the glitch. Yeah, the famous glitch. That Pretty people much. Talk about in the news sometimes. There's yeah. been a computer glitch. Yeah, somebody made a mistake. You know, I, I mean that. And people, so error is human. It's been around for that. Let me say for a long time. You were mentioning just before that you worked on a, a, a quantum computing. Yeah. What, what are we doing with that? Are uh, you trying to make it work? Well, uh, it's one of these things that, uh, you know, sometimes your manager gives you an assignment and you don't want to ask too many questions. And the assignment was, hey, Paul, go find out about this quantum computing stuff. Go find out about it. Yeah, go, go tell me what, you know. Doesn't IBM make them? It does. It's making quantum computers. Yeah, but I'm in the Linux Technology Center and it's IBM Research making them. And my, yeah. ma my manager's in the Linux Technology Center as well. So did you go and find the chips and, and well, connect you them? Well, you don't have them? to. You don't have to. I mean, if you, if you Google for IBM quantum experience, you'll be at a tutorial. If you run the tutorial, you'll get points. And with three points, you get five points, I think, back in, this was a while ago when I did it. Uh, you can spend the points to actually run programs on the real quantum hardware. Anybody can do this. You could, you could make an account, you could go through this stuff, and you can run. And you can simulate for free. Okay, so they have quantum simulators. They got one, a couple pieces of hardware you can use. But they have simulators that are just on a cloud, anybody can use them. And so I, so I went and figured out what it was doing and read up on it and so on. And, uh, it's one of these things where you don't want to ask too many questions when you get an assignment like that. Is uh, Why? Is yeah. it the, because well, it's the military? Because well, no. It's the, you know, the reason I don't want to ask too many questions is because if I ask, the thing is, he, what he told me is go off and have fun finding out about quantum computing, I've right? Asked too many questions, if I ask too many questions, it might be that I know the answer already, and then what, <laughs> I'm going to have fun with quantum computing, right? So it was fun? To work it was. For that? It was. Um, is it something special? Uh, potentially. Uh, the jury's kind of out. Um, and, and actually, it turned out it was good I didn't ask questions because the question really was what had happened is he, apparently he'd got somebody had asked him, well, what are you guys doing to Linux so it'll handle quantum computing? And he's going, I don't know. So he came to me and said, Paul, find out about quantum computing. Uh, but of course, it's straightforward at this point. This may change sometime in the future. So Linux right. just runs on quantum computers. Oh, yeah. What we do, in fact, it's better than that. What we do, you know, quantum qubits have superposition, right? I mean, you can actually have sort of kind of multiple values at once in a funny way. And so what we do is we run a superposition of Linux, Windows, and iOS on the same hardware. A super what? A super? We run a superposition. Superposition. Yeah, of Linux, Windows, and iOS on the same hardware. What's a superposition? That means you take two different things and kind of clump them together. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. pulling your leg, I'm sorry. Uh, All right. No, what, what it, what, what's going to happen is it's going to be kind of like an FPGA or GP GPU. Okay, so you have this big quantum computing thing. It, it's going to have a lot of performance. Uh, potentially, that's that's. Uh, this is really early times. As far as quantum computing is concerned, this is kind of like the 1940s for for real yeah. computing or, or classical computing, I'm calling it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you or have thought have know much about what was going on with uh, you know fully electronic sort of program computers in the 40s. That was they were cracking the Hitler codes. Well, that was that that was that was uh, not stored programs. 
there was a fully electronic, the Colossus. I've seen that. It's a really cool machine. If you ever get to uh, Bletchley Park in the UK, go go check it out. I mean, they run it. It still runs. They run the thing. The code cracking machine. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then before that, they have electric mechanical ones. Those are the bomb. That's the ones that Alan Turing was most involved in. Okay. Um, and they're really cool, but they're not stored programmed. And the bomb, the one that did the Enigma, that's not even fully electronic. Okay. Um, the oldest, still intact, uh, fully uh, fully electronic stored program computer is in Melbourne, Australia. Really? Yeah. It's in a museum there. So it's called what, the CYRAC. What were they doing? Uh, it was just a research project. Uh, they used it uh, for some kind of computations for a few for some years after it was uh, created. Did you see it? I did. You went all the way there just to check it out? No, nah, I was at uh, Linux Conf AU, and okay. that was one of the one of the uh, you know activities you could do. Yeah. No, I'm not quite that uh, crazy, but uh, maybe give me a few years, I might be. Anyway, the thing about it is that uh, you got to think about what that machine was. It had 2,000 vacuum tubes. Now, a vacuum tube is kind of like a light bulb, really, except a low wattage one, so it's like a 15 watt latch bulb. And uh, 15 times 2,000 is, in fact, 30,000, and the thing did, in fact, consume 30 kilowatts of power. Okay? Um, and a vacuum tube isn't as potent as a transistor. So if, uh, as a rough rule of thumb, if it takes five transistors in a circuit, it's going to take you seven vacuum tubes. And the reason is the transistors, uh, each in the transistor has about the same voltage range, and uh, tubes are wildly different. You know, you have a few volts high amperage at one end, and you have 600 volts really low amperage at the other, and you have to impedance match. Anyway, um, this thing had 768 words of memory, but this wasn't semiconductor memory. I mean, the, the transistor, this thing went into service in 1949. The transistor wasn't invented yet, okay? Um, it also wasn't core memory. I was giving somebody a hard time about, uh, you know, uh, don't trust bits you can't see. Core memory was the stuff that was about this big, and you actually see each bit with your naked eye. But it was before core memory, too. It was before video memory. Uh, what they used to do is they took a bunch of photos receptors and sta sta stamped them in front of a CRT. And they, they had long persistence phosphor. And so the electron beam would paint the image, and the photoreceptors would around. It wasn't that either, it was before that. This thing used acoustic memory. You'd run sound waves through an object, and it would take a while for the sound waves to get through, and that, that time was the storage for the sound waves. Okay? Yeah. Now, you didn't, back at that time, you could do it today, no problem. You make single crystal stuff, it'd be great. But in 1949, you didn't want anything solid because it'd have cracks and imperfections that would reflect the sound back and mess things up. So it had to be liquid. You want something where the, that had a really, really high speed of sound. Okay? There's a substance that checks all those boxes. Would you care to guess what it is? Um, water? I don't know. Air? <laughs> no, or air's not. Air's okay. not liquid. Water is, uh, has a, a much higher speed of sound than, than air, I'll give you that. But it's still not all that fast. So you want me to guess some more? Uh, if you want. I'll give you... Uh, yeah, you come li up one li more. Liquid uh, hydrogen or something. No, that'd be, you know, that, that would be interesting, although it wouldn't be... Mercury. Liquid mercury. mercury. Uh, and the thing is, you got to keep in mind, before the early 60s, metallic mercury was considered harmless. I mean, I had, when I was a kid, my cousins had this little toy that was a maze with a blob of mercury. Okay, it was, and, and so uh, that's the reason it's, it's the oldest intact computer and not the oldest operating one. Because there's no way you could make it work today and pass safety regulations. Yeah, okay. and not break some, uh, some of those things. Yeah. It'd be sad. You don't want to break an oh, historic yeah. thing yeah. like that. Yeah, and vacuum tubes are really hard to come by and they're really expensive. But uh, the, the thing is, is that's kind of where we're at with quantum computing right now. So it's, uh, uh, but nonetheless, they've got some, in, uh, some preliminary results uh, analyzing uh, molecular hydrogen, H2, and uh, li lithium hydride, and also beryllium dihydride, you know, BEH2. Um, and they use the quantum computer. The thing, the thing about the, the molecules is that there's quantum effects in them. And it takes a very large computer, a huge amount, you know, we're talking a big cluster, inverting these huge giga entry matrices. Uh, in order to solve it and figure out what the configuration of the molecule is, the lowest energy configuration of the molecule is. And the hope is, uh, and this is something that is still, I mean, that there's some, some encouraging initial results. The hope is that you can actually use the quantum nature of the quantum computer to directly model the quantum interactions that happen in a molecule and thus potentially solve it much more quickly. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of, as I said, this is really early times. Uh, it could be a threat for ARM. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, the thing is, right? The thing is, right now, the uh, biggest quantum computer in terms of qubits is from D-Wave. It's a company in uh, British Columbia, and it's got 2,048 qubits, 2048 of them. Okay, um, and you're not going to run Linux on that, right? Even if each qubit was worth 
100 bits, you're still not going to fit Linux on that, even if you're doing uh, what Nicholas uh, Pitch is, is working with. It's, it's still not going to fit. So right now what it is, you, have, you could have an arm there, no problem, because you're going to have a computer into which this attaches. So you can have this room full of cryogenic stuff and this little chip that does the, has the little qubits and the quantums and the waveguys and all that good stuff and the control. And it's going to plug in to a normal computer, perhaps like one of these guys here. That one's running ARM. This is an SA6. I don't know why you guys don't have a mainframe here. I, I, I guess we don't do embedded very well. But uh, that uh, means that uh, you know ARM could be the computer, uh, x86 could be the computer, power or mainframe could be the computer. But it, you'll have a normal computer there for some time. There may come a time, 20, 30 years from now, when we just have a quantum computer that runs by itself. But uh, quite frankly, in the study I've done, I'm I'm not optimistic about that. But you know, a lot can happen in 30 years, I can tell you that. Because <laughs> at IBM, they're doing lots of uh, crazy advanced uh, uh, chips, chip technology. Yeah. And you are in another department that makes the software run on all these crazy advanced chips. So what, what well, is you, it that usually, you do? Usually uh, what happens is that uh, the most of the time the chips are just ways of making things run faster on for normal computers. Uh, quantum computing being the exception that proves the rule. What I do is I'm down on the kind of the very low guts of the Linux kernel, there's a, there's a small piece of it that's my baby, RCU, which is a synchronization primitive that allows read mostly data structures to be processed really, really quickly with high scalability. So that's been a lot of fun as well. And uh, these Linaro guys, it's fun to see them once every five years or? Well, you know, uh, you see them you guys, online all the time. You guys right? are in San Francisco, so I figured I should drop by, you know, why not? Cool. All right, and you, you probably have all kinds of other things happening, right? Uh, and you no. have hobbies, uh, or they are, they are basically. I have, I, have, at, I, have, I, have, I have very weird hobbies. What is that? <laughs> well, uh, it's mostly related to what I'm doing. <laughs> all right, so so basically, your job is your hobby, right? A uh, pretty bit. much. I yeah, I get out in the gym. I do some hiking. Uh, living in the Pacific Northwest, you really you're really cheating yourself. You don't get out and and check out the waterfalls and the mountains and the trails and the trees. So I do that, uh, and uh, you know, it uh, cool. keeps things going. Cool, I hope we can do another video sooner than in five years. Well, it was good talking to you, Charbo. And right. uh, how do you pronounce your name? Charbax. Charbax, okay, like, All it's, right. like it's spelled. From armdevices.net. All right. All right, thanks And so you have a good one. Have a great evening.